Right, massive welcome to Silent Parks with jinn and shadow beings. Called jinn in Islam, other names in different cultures and religions just possibly might describe the same entities. Maybe angels, demons, thought forms, archons, boggarts, spirits, aliens, many more. Tonight, as darkness falls, night draws in. Simon speaks of the mysterious and ancient jinn and shadow beings and gives us an update on his latest research on the UFO phenomenon. Please welcome Simon Parks. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, probably about 50 of you, um, and I did say to the organisers that as it was the first one after the summer holidays, there'd be fewer of you. Um, something like 310,000 hits on YouTube watching New Horizons um, video of my last talk. And I believe that's the highest number of any alternative uh, organization in the country. So that's, that's really brilliant. Um, however, yeah. Okay, that's that bit over with. Um, I'm going to talk about shadow beings and jinn simply because A, they're not really discussed. Um, there's not a lot of information here in the Western world. Um, we don't really have a handle on this. Um, I did this presentation in a Masonic temple. I was asked to, to do it in a, a Masonic temple. Therefore, we're going to talk about um, jinn, magic, and shadows. It was reasonably well um, taken, and therefore at uh, Miles Johnson's basis project, which was in Marlborough, and I was speaker there, I ran this, and that went down quite well. So I promised to, to do it here, because I thought that Miles wouldn't get this up in time. <laughs> it is up in time. Did anybody see the presentation I did at Marlborough? That's, that's actually quite good, because it means you, you won't have to sit through it again. Okay, so what I'd like to do is to just give you a little bit of a, an update. Um, we'll just talk about some general things, and then we'll do the um, gin and the shadows. The blurb that appeared on your New Horizons website was taken from a pretty standard um, text, and those in the West who don't read the Quran, who don't have access to knowledge from the East, uh, really have very little handle on a jinn. And the issues there, of course, are that we don't appreciate them, appreciate what they are, where they've come from, and quite what's going on. Whereas those people who are Islamic, who have studied the Quran, it is not a mythology. And in fact, in the, the blurb, and this is no criticism, in the blurb of uh, the website, it actually says mythology. That would be like saying to an English person, 1066 is a mythology. It's not a mythology, it's history. 1066 was history. But to say to an Islamic person that jinn is mythology would be an incredibly rude thing to do because to them they are taught that jinn are real. And in fact, they have spells to get rid of them. So we need to understand from a Western perspective that we, as a, a part of the world, have completely lost contact with that side of it. Okie doke. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not staying at the uh, organizer's house tonight. I'm actually driving back to Whitby. So we are going to finish quite promptly because I won't get home until about two o'clock in the morning. So. If I could be given a 10 minute warning and then we'll go into questions so that we finish okay. Great. Okay, let's see how the technology goes. That's the image that New Horizons used to um, portray the talk. All the images I'm using tonight are either computer generated or drawn uh, from eyewitness accounts. Okay. Okay, in. Uh, in, in Whitby, there are a number of villages, and just as you have scarecrows, Rob, what was the name of the village we went through with the scarecrows? Staining. Say it again. Staining. Staining. Okay, so you have sta scarecrows at Staining, and they have a, a village in, near Whitby that does scarecrows, and this won first prize two years ago, and I always ask people to come down the rabbit hole with me, 
And so there's Alice and uh, the White Rabbit. Um, I've never made a, a, um, a hidden secret that I did have some programming. I had what was called the White Rabbit programming, which is a subset of the Alice in Wonderland programming. And a White Rabbit programming allows a fourth dimensional entity to attach to you so that it can move between the third and fourth reality. You think that in the Alice in Wonderland story, the rabbit was the only consistent creature between Wonderland and Alice's world. It went up and down to the rabbit hole. So that's why it's called White Rabbit Programming and has been used by the military, the Illuminati, ooh, since about the 50s. We'll start with a nice picture. I want to get you in the mood. There's Her Majesty. It's an old picture, it's well known, but it's just worth reminding ourselves that as the gold bullion decreases in the Western world, except in Switzerland um, and China, the Queen now howls probably the largest amount of gold outside of those two countries. And you don't get pictures like this anymore. Uh, that is her private personal gold. It's nice, isn't it? Okay, we live in a world where we are being continually constrained and uh, walking uh, in a, near a play park in Whitby, I saw a sign, not this one, but it said no, no ball games, no skateboarding, no frisbee. And I turned to the person with me and said, no fun, no joy. We live in a world where we are being constrained in such a way as we're not necessarily realizing it. I saw a taxi and not just on a sticker, but painted on the car, it said, no smoking no eating, no drinking. And I thought to myself, doesn't say anything about vomiting. Okay. And I spoke to a taxi driver and he said, oh, 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 yes, there is. No smoking, no eating. And it's a 60 pound soiling fee will be charged. So no, you can't vomit either. Okay, I want to talk about controlling. Um, the Americans are now on the verge of rolling out in tele streets. That's short for intelligent streets in New York uh, to replace the entire street lighting columns. Something like 230 to 250,000 street lights are going to be replaced. Not with these. Um, these are very sort of, uh, Victorian looking things. They'll be very modern. But in tele, in tele streets are street lamps that have a microphone can listen to your conversations as you walk past them. A camera to film you, a loudspeaker to talk to you. Um, it will also give you digital instructions. The way they're selling them to government is by saying, look, you know what, when the sun rises on one side of the street, these streets will auto lights will turn off automatically that half of the road that's lit. So it's a, an electrical saving. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that you are going to be spied on every time you walk down a road. So it's called Intelli Streets. Being rolled out in America will be, you know, come everywhere. So just be aware of that. Here's a nice way to tell people not to drop their fag butts. <laughs> That's somebody that hasn't been imprinted with the matrix. Somebody who can say, look, we've got rules, but let's not sort of be Colonel Blimp. Let's not threaten and shout and, and argue, and let's just do it in a clever way. You put the radio on, you put the television on, and it's fear, worry, concern. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's the Archers on Radio 4, whether it's EastEnders, whether it's a serious news item. There are key words being dropped in now, which are there to engender fear and disquiet. And, you know, if I didn't do what I do, I would just turn the news off completely and just would refuse to listen to it because it's 90% lies. But I have to listen to it because I need to know what they're saying. This was chalked up. I didn't do it. I'm not artistic enough. This was chalked up in Whitby. Try to love all the people Time to stop the hurt, be here now. What's happening is that the children are changing. This is a, a young woman, I guess. Um, the kids of today 
are very different from the kids of yesterday. In the height of my driving, teaching young people to drive, I was never bothered by a young person who said to me, why do I have to do that? Why do you, why do you want me to do that? But to a person of my, my generation, that's incredibly challenging, and to the system, that's really, really quite worrying. And that's why young people actually are rebelling, not as the days of the flower power, but in a much more spiritual way. And these signs are appearing all over England, not just in Glastonbury, where you would expect it, but in some of the most God-forsaken places like underground subways. And this is, this is the hope for the future. It really is. Okay, this is a well-known photograph. Uh, it's the International Space Station. It's, it's a posed picture. Every photograph coming from something that NASA is involved in will be posed. But the key, the key why I'm showing you that is that the guy is on a computer screen and he has a screensaver. So this is a publicly released picture. That's on the screensaver. This is what we call soft disclosure. It's where we um, pick up images or words said by the establishment to get us ready for some form of alien contact, either genuine or fabricated. Now the picture is flashing off and on. The brighter picture is taken from a NASA document called Disclosure. So the NASA had a, a document, electronic document called Disclosure, and they've just literally used the screenshot onto the front. So this is trying to send a message in a quiet way. You can Google this if you have the time to try and find it. Okay, uh, I went public, as you may know, uh, three years ago. And of course, the usual, the establishment turned on me and tried to make me out to be a Walter Mitty character or a crazy nut or whatever it is was the flavor of the month. And then, of course, I got invited to the top secret radar base. And that was a game changer, because when the military invited me for a three hour tour of one of the most sensitive facilities, not just in Britain, but in the world, all the media who had been attempting to make a fool of me were absolutely, well, the carpet was pulled from under their feet. And I had a number of people uh, from BBC, ITV, who would telephone me and say, we, we don't know what's going on, because we had a brief, <coughs> excuse me, we had a brief to, you know, uh, <coughs> take the discussions down a certain way, and now we find that the establishment are treating you very seriously. Is there anybody who didn't see the commemorative coin that I was presented with? Have you all seen this? You have, okay, good. I'm just gonna pass it around again. What I didn't show was the little pun that CND were doing, which was Star Wars. Um, because CND knew that this wasn't just a radar, space radar station to detect ballistic missiles. Uh, there was the potential for wars with other civilizations. And so they used to demonstrate at the height of the time saying, don't star wars, very clever. But most people didn't understand what they were saying. Um, having been uh, given this leg up by the military, suddenly taken very seriously, I then had the interview with um, Schofield and Holly Willoughby. And that was the time that they didn't want any pictures of a reptilian shown to the public, but they were quite happy with the mantid. Very interesting. So, you know, still can't talk about reptilians. And the new pope took his uh, inaugural speech um, and he said, I will baptize any aliens. Now, I was actually in Glastonbury um, and at half past six in the morning, I got a phone call from the BBC. I was in the bath saying, the Pope has just said he'll um, baptize aliens. Can we have a comment? That's how it's changed from being tried to make a fool of me. Now, when something like this happens, the establishment come to me for uh, a comment. So that radar base was a big, big game changer. And it really made it very difficult for people who had tried to debunk the whole alien agenda. Okay, um, I have to choose my words carefully now. I attended the BASIS conference, and um, after I'd spoken, 
an American guy came up and said, could he buy me lunch? And that was quite good. And I was with a few friends. And he um, said that he represented a group of elite people who um, were multi-millionaires, multi-billionaires, who had asked him to uh, come and have a chat with me. He was not their messenger, because that sounds rather belittling, and I don't mean it that way. I think he was their, you know, their interface, because, as he said, they will never meet you. And he said that uh, I had come across his radar because these people who he works for had told him that uh, they had watched me and that I was a genuine and that everything I'd said was for real. So they wanted to make me an offer. But before the offer, there was one question. I can't tell you what the question was. I was asked a question. It was a technology question, an alien technology question, which I partially answered at the table, but at a later date, I went into the car park and out of earshot of everybody else gave him a follow-up. Having answered his question, he said that an offer was that I would have bodyguards would be provided for me, armoured cars, and that if I wanted an underground bunker for me and my loved ones, these would be provided. And uh, normally there's a huge charge, but in my case it was for free. Um, I don't know about the bunker. I'm quite tickled at flying around Britain in blacked out armoured cars. That quite tickles me. But this is a very genuine offer. And it, 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 it's just interesting for me because I'm trying to be on a website called Avalon. Um, Bill Ryan, ex of Project Camelot, has a new project called Avalon. And sometimes people who join that don't take the trouble to speak to me or um, check out any of my videos. And they sort of say, oh, Simon Parks, never, his grandfather never worked for MI6 or his mother never worked for MI5. And here's the, here's the great dichotomy, because you have people who have never seen anything, perhaps never seen a ghost, never had a granny who read tea leaves, and have believed everything that they've been taught through their life. Um, and then, you know, there I am meeting somebody who is representing some very elite people who say, completely straight face, we accept everything you say, we need to go and do this. And this is the battle between those that have the power and the money, who know the truth, and those who are the, make up the vast majority of people who have had the truth hidden from them. And this is where it's grossly unfair. Everybody should have the same information and everybody should be able to make the choice. If people don't have the information, how can they make a choice? Okay, what are the shadows? Um, shadow people, shadow beings, shadow this, shadow that. What I want to do tonight is to talk about the shadows a little bit and try to see if we can come to some understanding between the difference between shadows and jinn, try and work out where they come from. Um, I'm not a, a researcher. Uh, I experience and I've experienced shadow creatures and jinn creatures for a very long time. Um, just lucky they don't, they don't hurt me. The Andersons, who made Stingray and Thunderbirds, made a very interesting TV show in 1968 or 69 called UFO. And the headquarters for this fictitious base was a supreme headquarters alien what is it? defense organization, and they use a shadow. I don't believe that that's just chance. Here's a speaker, a um, very well-known lady, and she's talking about the hat man. This is a well-known shadow image that people have. I was just a little bit um, surprised at this because why are the shadows watching you? And I think in, a, in my talks, I really don't want to inject any fear. Um, it's a balancing act between telling you my truth and what I know to be true and sometimes that's not very good news. But I'm certainly not in the business of trying to scare you or use language that would, would fear you. So I would never use what this lady has done. Why are the shadows watching you? Um, it's much better to say, okay, let's work out what they're about. 
because you know we can't afford to be scared of anything. These are real drawings from a child, two, two separate children. Um, they both depict what we call the hat man. I won't ask you to put your hands up, but I'm sure people here have had experiences with shadows, whether they are hat men or not. Um, why would they uh, turn up with a hat? It's very interesting, isn't it? Because men in black also have hats. So there might be a link there. Here's another child's drawing. Um, these children are not related. They're from all over the, the Western-speaking world. And this young, this young girl is showing a drawing where she's frozen and she can't move. She's absolutely frozen. She's not in a bed. She's actually standing up. But she's locked solid. She can't move. And this creature appears to be a black being with a hat. It's a painting of another one. That actually could be a man in black. So it's becoming very difficult. Another child's drawing where they would be in their bedroom and this creature would just peer around at them. Of course, parents who have no experience will just imagine it's a dream and can't support the child properly. Another drawing, this time the shadow is walking through the wall. What I want you to be aware of is I've put these into the shadow being section and not the gin section because there is no smoke rising off these creatures. It's a very important definition. There's no smoke coming off them. This is a really old one. It goes to about 1900, 1901. It is a photograph, an original photo. Um, that actually is, is a very interesting, either an alien or a robotic alien, or it could be a djinn. But it's the black garb looking like a nun. It's one of the first earliest UFO alien photographs ever taken. You see that? That is exactly what a shadow being would look like should see through them. They should be a humanoid shape and male shape. Okay. I don't know who this guy is. This was brought to me not because it's a member, member of the family, but because of the shadow behind the gentleman, the old gentleman. That is a, not an accurate shadow. There is something going on there. Okay. Shadows don't necessarily appear as people. They can appear as angular, sharp objects. Sometimes they appear as spiders, either very, very small ones drawn to very high electromagnetic pulses or ele electronic equipment, sometimes huge. Okay, so what are the jinn then? In uh, the East, they're called from the smokeless fire, which is odd because we would associate smoke with them. But this is the old texts, smokeless fire. Here is a very new, but reflecting a very old um, idea of a jinn attempting to um, corrupt an imam or a holy man. The holy man is on a flying carpet or he's actually down praying and the jinn is attempting to turn him. And that is exactly how the Quran sees these creatures as those creatures that come down to cause trouble. And they are seen as uh, beings that um, generally aren't very useful. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. We're all familiar with Aladdin. This is how uh, children portray it. Remember the word genie is just from the word jinn. So this is how close the link is, but how it's been lost in the West. And you go to a theater, and because it's described as in blue, uh, so the, uh, the uh, actor puts on a blue costume, plenty of smoke. We always associate smoke with the creature coming out of the lamp. Here we have some very nice digital artwork based on people's experiences. You have a face coming out. Now, it's put to the lamp because that's the pun. The reality is it wouldn't necessarily come out of a lamp, but we'll talk a bit more about that. That's another one. This is really good because you've got two eyes, a face, and the right elbow and arm coming out. So there is a head and a body, and the rest of the body is just a trail of smoke. I'm not sure about the blue color. I think that's because Aladdin's gen genie was, was blue. In Hungary, which is, you know, a bit more towards the east than we are, they have stamps and there's Aladdin. So in this, this country, Aladdin is seen as something that you go to a pantomime, but in other countries, it's actually seen as something very, very serious. This is the picture that 
horizon, New Horizons used to introduce the talk. Um, it's a very useful one. We can see that there are four digits on the hand and it has reptilian-like traits. There's another one with a very pointed, uh, what's like hair, and it's coming out from somewhere, again, trail of body. Since the Renaissance, um, classical artists have drawn the, uh, the female who is being uh, visited by a demonic entity, and the creature that's depicted there be a djinn. Hat man and a hooded figure. Now these have smoke rising from them. So I don't consider these shadow beings. I consider these jinn. So here we have a problem because we've seen pictures of the hat man that have been drawn by experiences who show no smoke coming off them. Yet here we have some. So do we have a situation where some jinn are pretending to be shadow beings? That's my drawing, which you should perhaps be familiar with now. Um, and I always called him my smoke man. I never said he was a shadow being. It was the researchers who said, oh, that's a shadow being. But I've clearly drawn him with smoke coming off his body. I think that's a djinn. That's my own personal view. Here's someone else's drawing of another thing they've seen. That's very, 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 very similar to mine. And also this one has red eyes and the smoke is coming off them. I think that's definitely a djinn. Here's another drawing of a mother and two children. And this is a very humanoid looking creature, but the smoke coming off it, I would say that was a djinn. I would say that was a djinn because if you look down to its arm, you can see smoke coming off it. This is a, not a real photo, this is a re, you know, representation. This is a real photo. Two pictures. First one, this black mass, which doesn't appear to be anything at all. And then when we look at this, you can most definitely detect and the smoke coming up. So that would be a gin. Remember, you can catch things on a camera that your eye doesn't record onto your brain. So your eye sees these things, but the brain doesn't always imprint it to, the, to, to remember it. And that is quite a nice picture. Animals often appear in people's rooms. And if it's not a, an, a, an alien actually going into your mind and making you think that there's an animal in your room, and I've had that when I was having um, an implant put into my hand, um, and I got very upset with the way the, the skin was opening out to take the implant. The alien went into my mind and I had a, a cheetah and a giraffe in the room. They weren't in the room, but in my mind I saw them and it allowed them to do what they needed to do. This is a representation of somebody who's, I think, has seen a gin, and the gin is having a problem working out what to do with the tail. Okay, because they just don't always get it. That's quite a, an interesting character. I would say that was a djinn pretending to be a wolf. Again, that's taken from someone's descriptions. And this drawing, which you should be familiar with, um, this is the young woman who now works uh, for the Rothschild, um, who uh, they sent to me because she had a djinn possession. Uh, she also had five alternate personalities, six alternate personalities. And um, I removed the djinn from her and allowed her core being to reabsorb the alternate personalities. And that's done through torture. One of the ways of controlling a very high-souled person, particularly a female, is to insert jinn into them. Uh, a jinn will uh, not take control of that person, but will dumb them down so they can't be spiritual and they will accept things and do things that they wouldn't normally think about. So if you have a family with star children and the, the mother is aware of that and is trying to uh, do the best that she can for them, then negative forces will try to in, in, infiltrate that family. Uh, if the female doesn't have a male in her life, they will set up a situation where she will meet a male. Uh, he will be a, what we would call a dark magician. He will be a uh, a satanic magician and he will conjure forth a djinn and the djinn will be placed into her and then his access will be hopefully for his point of view to get to the children and this goes on all the time um, I have people who come from all over the world to have these djinn taken out 
uh, and you protect, you know, those that are vulnerable. And I don't charge for it. I should really have charged these people. I didn't know it was the Rothschilds who had sent this person to me. Uh, I honestly thought this person had come to me out of her own volition. Had I known then what I know now, I would have charged them a quarter of a million pounds because they can afford it and they could then subsidize everybody who can't afford it. Um, and I think it's probably worth talking a little bit how gin work in with families. When you have a family that's identified to run in a very high um, uh, elite way, then you will want the children at a very early age and you will, from their perspective, need to torture those children because only through torture can you uh, make that child break their mind down into different compartments to place the pain in there. So the biggest exponent of this would have been Dr. Mengele, uh, who became an American citizen, and he was known as either Dr. Green or Dr. Black. And he would quite happily, and I'm using the word deliberately, he would quite happily torture children, um, but have a puppet show taking place in front of them, and the child would place the pain in a character of the puppet. So we'd just call a puppet George. I hope there's nobody here called George. We'll have a, a puppet called George. So when that child has reached a point where the pain is too great, then George becomes not just a puppet, but a character within that child's mind, it becomes a set personality. So whenever that person is tortured again, it is George that takes the pain, so that child can then get on with their life. So when you, you create a butterfly, which is a female who is going to have sex with male Illuminati high-ranking families, you create an altar that that person will go into, not through torture, but through key words. And that female then will quite happily have sex with a whole range of men because it's her altar that's doing that, not her. And when a human female is to have sex with a reptilian, a white reptilian, the, key, the Illuminati word for such a female is dragonfly. So any, any human female who is a dragonfly will have sex with a non-human entity. So jinn, of course, are not aliens in the true sense of the word. Jinn are interdimensional. They live between the third and the fourth dimension. That's why magicians can call them fourth because they have experience of third and fourth realities and are just always on the edge of our perception and can come forward. So we'll talk more about them in a minute. You can see how this was going down with the Masons, can't you? This is quite good because if you've just been looking at the drawing that the young woman did for me, here's another rendition from somebody else. And look how the spikes are on that, they're very similar. Look at the spikes. Although this is much smaller, this is probably about, in your money, 30 centimetres long. Look at the tail, I call it a tail. Look how this young woman drew it coming out to point. Look how this person has tried to draw the smoke out. It's not coincidence. Many people see jinn as cherubs. And I'm sorry, Church is not going to like it. That's why there are so many cherubs associated with churches and gargoyles. I didn't get a drawing of a gargoyle, I didn't have time. But so as not to scare the intended target, a jinn will do this and become like a newborn babe. Oh dear. This is, who is this? Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell, yes. A dark magician when he puts a jinn into a target female, will have a pet nickname for the target female, and that is Tink. So any female who is referred to as Tink is carrying a Tinkerbell, which means a jinn. Um, and again, these people um, will exhibit it in certain ways. And one of the ways is their eyes going black. So not, not the white parts of the eyes, but the iris going absolutely black. That's when they have a demonic possession. Ted Heath had one of those. Um, yeah, this is, this is quite common, um, and we'll talk about how they're conjured in a minute. Here's a drawing where a jinn can appear as a female um, to entice a man. 
That is a real picture. Thank you to the War Minister, War Minister UFO Group for this. I am calling this a gin. I'm sure they wouldn't probably call that a gin. They would call that something else, probably a, an entity from, from a spaceship or another dimension. This is a gin. Let's just go back here. Look at the tail. The tail coming out from the lamp. Now look at that. That's a gin. That's a real photograph. Okay, that's a gin. This is also a real photograph, though, of course, people, debunkers will say, no, that's a model. Even if this was a model, that is so good. And you can see now where the cherub comes from with the wings. Got another one here. Look at the similarity. And you know what? Even if it is a model, that is so good. You'd have to have seen one to create it that clever. You would have to have experience with them. Um, not far from where I live is a, is a city called Lincoln, and hidden up in the cathedral is the famous Lincoln Imp. And uh, it's been carved there for many hundreds of years. It looks just like that. Think of all the gargoyles on the outside of churches. Uh, Tony Z sent me this picture. It's now available on the internet. I have used it before and I'll continue to use it. I'm sure um, those who don't want the subject will say that's a very big fish. Uh, the story that goes with this is that this creature was killing the villagers and the only way they could kill it was putting thin wire and it literally was decapitated. A gin will look like that. The best way to describe it is as a piranha fish. When a gin doesn't like you, that's its real self. When it wants to connect with you, it might be a cherub, it might be the drawing that I showed you of the young woman who now works for the Rothschilds, like a little fairy, depending on what its, its roles are with you. So, okay, why there's so much gin activity around me? Um, uh, when I have Skype sessions with people who are psychic, they will often see things going on behind me. Um, there are a couple of people now who are so used to it, they don't pass any comment. Um, and last summer I was at the seafront with a member of the family, it was about 8 o'clock, and I was on the prom looking down maybe 10 feet to the sea, the tide was coming in. And you know a gin because the way your eyes are constructed, you have cones in the front and rods at the side. And because of the energy signature of a gin, you'll see it at the corner of your eye. And as it moves in front of you, you see nothing. And then as it exits, you see it come out. So you know it's not a bat or a bird because there'll be nothing. And we're all, all sort of human and we'll, we'll look and think, what was that? And of course, that's the worst thing you can do because if you look straight at these objects, you won't see them. And I had about seven or eight of these just in front of me. And a member of the family came up and said, have you seen all these strange birds? <laughs> and I just laughed and said, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're just looking for insects. And I've often found that sometimes it's better not to go into a, um, an explanation because it might not be the right time. Past life. You can buy these. Hello. You can buy these. Uh, they're sold as uh, King Solomon's ring. Okay, so it has a, has, a, has a pentagram on the front of it, and they sell this for a lot of, a lot of American dollars, and it's sold, sold as King Solomon's ring. Well, if you've taken the trouble to actually read any of the scriptures, you'll know that that's not the dimensions of King Solomon's ring. Uh, any Illuminati house will have a number of books. Certainly, it will have the Lord of the Rings. Rings are very important for conjuring jinn. I could be really naughty and ask anybody here, has anybody here conjured a jinn? wonder if anybody would admit to that. Okay, if you type in Solomon's Temple, this is invariably the image you get. It's totally incorrect. But you do have the two pillars, and the two pillars are portals. Boaz and Jachin. These are the pillars, and inside, a portal opens, allows you to... I'm getting some strange things happening. Uh, I'm used to it. 
um, allows you to either bring things through or send them through. Hobbit, okay. Audience participation. Who saw the film The Hobbit? A few of you. The two pillars. Do you remember in, in my other talks where I'd say to you that stuff is hidden in plain sight? Two pillars. Bilbo Baggins is walking through a portal and on either side of him are two little orbs. This is exactly what they're telling you. Okay, and where does he come through? Into another world. So he stepped through a portal and gone through. Hollywood is absolutely rife with a mixture of disinformation and real information um, which they are being deliberately pushed to put out to us. That is much more like the real temple. It's a little bit too high. That's much more like King Solomon's temple. This is the Kabbalah. Kabbalah is uh, from the Western now, it's Jewish, it's a magic. And those of you who do tarot, who does tarot here? Just two? Heck, okay. This should mean something to you. Okay. The vast majority of uh, magicians who command a jinn, and that is the correct terminology, to command a jinn, do so by wearing an iron ring. The iron ring must be solid. It must be hand forged. It actually must be hand forged by a man, naked from the top up. Um, it must have no impurities other than what you would expect in iron. And the iron ring uh, is used to entrap the jinn. That's what is taught. Um, you would then use some very, very long magical commands to make this happen. That's actually not quite really what's going on here. If we believe in reincarnation, if we believe that we perhaps have been on this planet before, we have different bloodlines and different souls. The jinn will not serve somebody who doesn't have the right bloodline. And it's really not much to do with the ring. But the jinn who don't like humanity need an excuse to serve a magician. <sighs> need an excuse to serve a magician. And so what they say is, I am serving the ring I am serving the master of the ring. And think about Lord of the Rings, the master of the ring. Because the jinn can't bring themselves to say that we are serving this individual human. So we will serve the ring master or the ring lord, but we want a deal in return. So the jinn will get something in return for it. Huge businesses, if you go on the internet, and you can go through eBay, <laughs> Uh, you can get people, you can pay them to get rid of gin for you. Um, and all of these magicians that I'm aware of will use conjuring um, and very sacred texts, and they will do a deal with that creature, um, and in return that creature will obviously want something. And many, many people would be surprised at just how many uh, are possessed by what you call a demonic spirit, it's a jinn. Because everything from uh, in the Far East where, say in Turkey, a businessman reneges on a deal, then um, the equivalent of the mafioso won't come round and shoot him up. They will actually have a jinn set on him. They will go to a local magician, pay him in some form of uh, money, and he will send a jinn against that individual. And that is part and parcel of a culture which we have no concept here. We have two people, Charles Darwin and Wallace. Now I was an auxiliary lecturer at the Natural History Museum for a number of years and my job was to meet school children coming from all over the country uh, and to conduct them around the museums, take them around the dinosaur section, <laughs> where else would I be, um, and run workshops with them. And I did that for a number of years. And if you go to the Natural History Museum in London, you will find a bigger than life size uh, marble statue of Darwin sitting on a chair, 
very grand, very important. But if you look to the right of him, maybe two meters, is a small oil painting. And it says, Alfred Wallace, co-author of The Origin of Species. But how many of you actually, before you became aware, realized that Charles Darwin co-authored the book Origin of Species with Wallace? The way it's taught is there was only one man, and it was Darwin. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that Charles Darwin's father was a 33-degree mason. He was the one that paid for the, the beagle. He paid for it all because he, not he, he was carrying out orders from very high up because they wanted a ideology of the survival of the fittest because that's an incredibly reptilian um, lifestyle. And, you know, Providing humans continue to eat meat, the cycle cannot be broken. So for those of you who are not too squeamish, um, if we can accept that some forms of reptilians will consume human flesh, that's okay because you humans are consuming other animal flesh and so the circle doesn't get broken. So we have a situation where um, Wallace said I can go along with evolution of species for everything but humans. This is impossible. Um, and Wallace was completely frozen out. You won't find that, will you? I had to go everywhere to find a female at the top. I had to make a statement. Why is it always men? Why? <laughs> so, uh, we all understand evolution. We're shown a primitive half monkey type creature, and it seems just quite rightly just to work its way up nice and steady till we get to the most highly evolved species, which is obviously a female. Um, and we accept that because we know that if we are imprinted with pictures, that is much more powerful than lots of text. So here's a fossil record with Homo rudolfensis at 1.8 million years old. He's not a particularly handsome looking beast, is he? This is from the Natural History Museum. This isn't from, you know, some crazy art place. So that's what it looked like 1.8 million years ago. That's another one, um, Paranthropus, about 2.2 million to 1.8 million years ago. So what in God's name happened at 1.9 million years ago? If you put this gentleman in a suit and a hat, he could go in to somewhere and buy a coffee and could get away with it. It is not possible for a creature to evolve from something very primitive to something much more advanced without outside intervention. Okay. Um, I'm not trying to take anything away from, from, from humankind. Um, my own view is that humans were here a long time ago in a very evolved form and were tricked and were, for want of a better word, dumbed down. In other words, the 12 plus strands of DNA were reduced to make human creatures incapable of evolving spiritually, um, forget who they were, where they came from, what they were capable of and we're just there to do the bidding of somebody else. Now, of course, things are very different. Humans are energetically creating or reconnecting their DNA strands. People are questioning, people are aware, people are not taking the BS anymore. We, we know when we're being lied to and we don't like it. The problem is that we are not the establishment, we are individuals, and most of us don't believe in violence. Whereas the establishment does believe in violence and has what appears to be all the strings, all the cards. And I'm often asked, you know, how do we get out of this mess? We went from a Stone Age culture of what's called pebble tools and literally overnight to, and when I say overnight, we're talking 100,000 years, to a, what's called the hand axe culture. Um, it may not look much to you, ladies and gentlemen, but this was an incredible evolutionary jump to go from a roughly hewn pebble to a beautiful created stone, what we call a hand axe. Um, the brain will have had to have been changed dramatically. That doesn't occur naturally. If you think about a wolf, a wolf 
a natural wolf now is exactly as it was 12,000 years ago. That hasn't evolved to change. But if you take a dog like a German Shepherd and look back 100 years after humans have been breeding it towards a set pattern, look how that dog's changed. Those of you who have dogs, look how they have changed from what they really were in a very, very short period of time. That is with external intervention. And that is exactly what's occurred to the human race. External intervention. So in other words, we think, oh, I'm really superior, we're really clever, we're not like the monkeys. Yeah, but are you as clever as when you were in Lemuria or where you were in Atlantis? You've got a rough deal. Those of you who do tarot, we talked about tarot, um, there's a very nice set called the... Well, let's go around it this way, first of all. Um, there was a guy called Alistair Crowley, who you may well know, um, know of. And he was a very interesting magician, dark magician. Uh, he actually tried to work for MI5. And he maintained that Winston Churchill's V for Victory was actually created by him. There is some truth in that. And there are a number of um, tarot sets. He created one called the Toth Tarot, which is um, perhaps one of the closest to real magic that you might get. Um, and there are a number of other spin-offs. This one actually shows a reptile at the tree of knowledge and Eve. So this is the downfall of mankind. These are called the lower uh, arcani cards. And these cards have generally just been devoid of pictures. But using mm, cards held by a sect called the Golden Dawn, which was something set up by Lister Crowley, for the first time these cards have come up. And it's called the Liber T Deck. Liber T Deck. And so these are uh, images that have been held sacred and now are being released to the public. So we have Eve, the tree of knowledge, and a reptile. There's a four more cards, and the one on the right shows a reptilian creature with his hands outstretched. Why would you use reptilian-type creatures in a tarot set? unless you knew something that the vast majority of the public didn't know. Okay. Um, you remember I was just saying to you that sometimes it amuses me that people uh, question some of the things I say the most. I don't mind people questioning me um, on subjects they should do, but for instance, my grandfather, um, you know, there are some people who say I never had a grandfather. My daughter worked uh, for an organization very closely with the British Army. She's not there at the moment. Uh, her boss was a brigadier. And she had access to information that we wouldn't have. And she found a photograph of my grandfather. I'm going to actually pa pass it around because it's brilliant. It's taken in 1941. Uh, he's a British consul in India um, getting into a car. It's obviously a posed picture. Uh, but it shows what information is held on people and is not released, but only certain people have it. So I'm just going to pass that around. I was a driving instructor for a number of years, and when you become a driving instructor, you have to have a special driving license. And when I applied to the DVLA for my driving license, they had a real problem with me, because they said, we have no record of you in any school in England. In fact, you don't exist. Uh, and it sort of made it very difficult. I had to wait something like three months for my uh, special license to come through. And it only came through because I was able to find a document that proved that I was here in those days. And yet it appears that establishment have information regarding me, which isn't in the public domain. So I guess when this physical body dies, I will be completely expunged from the records. I'll exist on YouTube or whatever there is, um, but his, from an establishment point of view, I will never have been to school here, I'll have never had a doctor here. And that's what they do with people they don't like. They just wash them away. Okay, we're gonna have a quick tea break. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. 1965 then, I was visited by 
what I call the smoke man, we could call it a gin. Um, the creature appeared to me, uh, the drawing that I showed you, uh, probably about six foot tall, two little eyes, um, just pointy hands, pointy legs like a star, black with ethereal smoke continually rising from it but not dissipating out. The creature came through the window and glided towards me, no movement of legs, just glided towards me. Um, and this creature was not dissimilar to something I'd seen before, so I was more comfortable with it. I was always, as a child, very scared by something the first time, because I had no association with that particular creature. But after I'd visited, or they'd visited me for more than two or three times, I became familiar with them. And if the subject is not hurt, then why would you be scared? If you take a cat or a dog to the, to the vet, they're only scared because things happen to them there they don't like. But the very first time you take a dog or a cat, unless they're psychic, um, they'll be quite happy. So if a child is not harmed in any way, um, then it, it, it won't respond with the, with the fear reaction. So this, this creature would communicate telepathically. I don't even recall it having a mouth or, no, or nose for that matter. Um, and I asked it what it was and it said, I am your teacher, I am here to make you better. To which as a five-year-old child I replied, I'm not ill or not sick. And the creature replied, to make your mind better. Um, and for the next three months, this creature would interact with me, and I'll give you a description of that interaction. But over that period of time, my, um, my education in school, I've been in the first, first year of real school, five years, six years old, went right down the pan. So, uh, so much so that the teachers were very concerned about me, and I had special lessons in school. My grandfather, who had a bob or two, paid for an English teacher to come to the house on Saturday and a math teacher on the Sunday. And I developed what we would now call dyslexia, though it wasn't termed that, during this period of time. After the end of the three months, then a very strange thing happened. My reading age at the age of five shot up to 12. Uh, although my spelling has never been good, and my handwriting has always been, been pretty awful. Um, but this is the period that I would have what we would call dyslexia. Right, the, the creature's objective was to get me to predict the future. Uh, we would play the, what we call the arm game, the arm game. Uh, the creature would stand in front of me and ask me to copy it, so it would hold its arm out to think of a clock face behind me, and that would be, what would that be? Three o'clock or nine o'clock? My dyslexia, you see, oh, backwards. Um, so it would hold its arm out like that, and I would copy it. And then its other arm might go up to what might be two o'clock, and I would copy it. And it would be doing it at this speed, and that's just a copy. And then it would get faster and faster and faster. And then in the end, I'm having to mirror it really quickly. And that's what anybody can do, that's just, just normal. Um, then it would put its arms down and think where its arms would go. So it would send me an, a, a picture that its arm would be at two o'clock and then I would be having to react to where it's sending me the picture. Towards the end of the training program, it said to me, I want you to put your arms where I would put my arms if I was going to. I'm going to help you out with that because that's very tricky. It didn't physically move its arms. It didn't send me any telepathic messages as to where its arms were going to go. But what it said was, if I was to move my arms, where would I move them to? And then I then went into this position of where the arms would go. And I'm being taught to be precognizant, to be able to look into the future. So my established education went right down 
because what was being developed was another part of me, which is absolutely a million miles away from what's stuffed down people's throats in, in the education world. At the end of the interaction period, then something had changed, um, but it didn't affect me in school in that sense of the word, uh, although the dyslexia has always been with me from that point and it's never going to go away. And that was a sort of the, the time frame where I would be in bed and I would look at the lamp or the light hanging from a single flex and the French windows would be open and there would be a gentle breeze blowing through and the lamp would be spinning clockwise. And I would lie in bed and think, well, I don't want it going clockwise. I want to make it go anti-clockwise. So this is not the sort of standard behavior. So we'd sort of sit there and sometimes I was successful, sometimes I, I wasn't. Um, but I would attempt to make it turn the other way. Now, this is totally different from a, a satanic magician who um, will hold his hands up like this and the audience will see stars on the end of each of his fingers because that isn't really happening. It's gone into your mind. Um, one, one real example would be in a hall in December when the subject of the attack and two friends were in a hall, and this is December, and this magician and a butterfly appeared and flew around the hall. And one guy who was much more um, uh, psychically aware, much more um, spiritual, realized that he just didn't know why consciously, but he had to get this thing and not let anyone else touch it. And he quickly went and got it and his hand and took it outside. And the magician was absolutely furious that the intended target hadn't done that. There was no butterfly in that room. But in the minds of the people, they saw a butterfly. And here in the Western world, it's almost inconceivable that another human, another person can enter not just one mind, but a group mind and make them all think they see the same thing. When I was uh, at the Amash, when I was part of the Amash group, and I left that because I was being attacked left, right and centre, um, not because I was being attacked, but because the damage it was doing to people who were my very good friends and who were being turned against me off and on like a switch. And I'm never prepared to put other people in the firing line because I've become a target, so I will withdraw myself. But in this period of time when I was with Amash, uh, it had been organised for a, a um, hypnotherapist to come over from Ireland um, and I became somewhat concerned uh, at the uh, remit of the hypnotherapist and uh, I asked the hypnotherapist, you know, well, what's your plan? And he said, well, I'm going to break everybody's contact with their alien connections, whether they like it or not. And interestingly enough, there was a three to four minute video of him on YouTube. He's incredibly successful. He doesn't do the usual stop smoking, don't be scared of heights. He works for American corporations who <coughs> hypnotherapize their top businessmen to be really good businessmen. And people don't realize that that's what big corporations do. And there's a two minute video of him and he's with a group of college kids and he stands up and he points and he gets one of the kids up, he's about 18 or 19, and he says, copy me. And he says, turn around and point and say after me, I can point at the door because I am in control. It's on YouTube. And afterwards, I'll tell you the name of the person, I'm not doing it publicly. I can point at the door because I am in control. Okay, no swinging of a watch or circles turning. Then the young man says, I can point at the door because I am under control. It took 15 seconds to get that young man under control. This is the power, and a lot of these stage magicians are actually really true, really genuine. I mean, in the 50s, it was always ants in the pants. 
you know, people would go up on stage and the magician would say, you've got ants in your pants, and they would jump around. And everybody thought, yeah, it's a set up. Actually, there are developed humans out there who can do that. And it's often thought that, you know, when you're a new age or you're spiritually aware, you're a good person, you give up meat and you are ethical. And it's hard to understand that some of the most negative people on the planet also give up meat. Because when you give up meat, it actually increases your spiritual uh, ability. But if you're a magician and you give up meat, it increases your magical powers. So that's why any true Illuminati person doesn't eat meat. No true magician should ever eat meat. Hitler never ate meat. So it isn't just the good people, for want of a better word, it's those who have a different agenda. We live in a world where we are faced with two choices, good or evil. The reality is, you know, what the hell is good and what the hell is evil? We have a very uh, contrived notion and we decide what side of the fence we're on. The reality is, and it is a real reality, that unless we engage with those that have a different view to us, we cannot actually change the balance. The project that I did this presentation for is a genuine project called The Vault. I'm going to give them a bit of a plug, whether they like it or not. Uh, it's a wonderful project based in a Masonic temple. Now, contrary to public belief, 99.999% of the Masons are very good people. I'm going to repeat that. The vast majority of Freemasons are very good people. Just like any other organization, it's the very top echelons. Freemasons give up their time for nothing to do community jobs, community good. In my own town where I live, if it wasn't for the Freemasons, there wouldn't be what we call a charitable Boxing Day dip in Whitby. People dress up in costumes, which they create themselves, and they run in on Boxing Day into the sea, and they raise money for charity. It only happens because the Freemasons actually provide everything free of charge. So we need to be very, very careful when we have a blanket description of Freemasons as being bad. There are percentagely more bad bankers in the world than there are Freemasons. Let's just get that straight. So Freemasonry in itself is not bad. It's just like anything else, there are people at the very top who will change and alter and use it for their own demise. The problem is it's a secret organization and therefore most people are excluded from it and we don't understand what is going on, why it's going on, and we feel separate. Um, and there is law, magic hidden in um, images and texts, which we don't have the right in terms of the way it works to have that. But it doesn't mean it's wrong. And if we go through life hating, if we go through life actually saying, well, you know, I feel, I feel a bit of a victim or I'm angry, we can't affect change. I went public, <clears throat> not because I wanted to write a book. I haven't written one yet. It's not published. I didn't do it for anything other than to actually begin to open a debate, something that the humans must talk about. Establishment must face it. I also went public because I wanted to give strength to others who were thinking that they might go public or they were having experiences um, and they really didn't know quite what to do. And I'm heartened by the number of people who, who message me to say, thank you, I was going through a very difficult time. You've actually helped in some, some short way. And that's why, unlike some of the very big names that we associate, I don't make money out of this. It's very important for me, this. Uh, when I do a talk like this, I expect to get some money, but I don't make a living on it. I get my petrol money and a little, little bit extra. People come from all over the world to consult with me. I don't charge them. It's crazy. It's crazy because we live in a system where, you know, uh, I go into a shop, I can't have something unless I give you something. And that needs to be broken. You know, I have an allotment. Um, and I say to somebody, oh, look, you know, I've got uh, a couple of pounds of potatoes I don't want. Do you want them? The, the feeling is embarrassment. 
because don't they have to pay for it? And I give it to them, and then 10 minutes later, oh, oh, do you want some apples? Do you want this? Why do people feel they have to give back? If I give something, I give it out of love, not because I want something in return. But, but people generally are so conditioned by the matrix that we live in that they are absolutely playing out a set pattern time and time and time again. And we have to break that pattern. And this young woman who's chalked on one of the promenade walls in Whitby has not just broken out, she's doing what I'm doing. She's writing a message. She's trying to get something across to people. Um, those of you who have had hard times with entities of any sort know that if you can project love, the creature will just disappear because there's nothing for it to feed on. In ancient Rome, people slaughtered each other in the arena. If we'd had the, the right equipment, we would have looked all around the top of the arena. You would have seen it absolutely thickly populated with entities absorbing death from the bloody spectacle taking, taking place. And as long as humans can create that through violence and wars, why would these creatures go? Why would they leave you? You're giving them everything they want, not you, because you are awake, that's why you're here. But until humanity realizes what is happening on this planet, um, it is fighting a battle, and I'm using language that we use in the 3D, aren't I? We're fighting a battle that we don't understand. Come back to what I said earlier, people say to me, what should we do? And they want to take up arms, they want to demonstrate, they want to do this. No, you need to go inside yourself and you need to change. You need to actually project forgiveness, love. That's the hardest thing. It's very hard. But if you stop, stop those elements that you were programmed to produce, the system will begin to fall down. You know, we, we think we need to take up a gun. I'll, I'll tell you, I talk, spoke to a, a, a major of the American military who said that the object to take away high-powered rifles from the citizens of America was based on this premise. When the American people discover the lies that they have been given, they will rise up against us. And he said, imagine you have a gun that we allow you to have in America, and you want to shoot me, you have to come to the window to shoot me. But we have, the military, we have high-powered rifles. We just shoot through the walls and kill you. That's why the Americans wanted the high-powered rifles removed, so that it was an unfair battle. And if we think back to Sandy Hook, and if we think back to times where bulletproof doors were smashed through with lots and lots of bullets with a high-powered rifle. Oh, let's ban high-powered rifles. I'm afraid that things happen in our world that are orchestrated, planned, and organized 10, 15, 20 years in advance. And many of them haven't come to fruition. Um, the British are working on a new drone called Tyrannis, which is the named after a Gaelic god. The Americans have a spy drone called Sentinel. And it was a Sentinel drone that was supposedly shot down by the Iranians some three years ago. But the reality was that it wasn't shot down. The Sentinel drone contained some very, very, very advanced micro circuitry. That craft, which looks just like the Roswell spacecraft, Actually, if you go on, on eBay and type in Roswell UFO, you will see for $15 or $20, whatever it is, a company called Testers, and that's a very good representation of the Roswell spacecraft. Both the British latest drone and the American's latest drone are spitting images of that craft. Well, that craft was force landed down in Iran to balance up the technology. Now the Iranians now have microcircuitry and they're only five years behind the Americans. So the Americans have lost a big technological leap. So what's happening on the planet? Technologically, things are being balanced. And if you saw my um, interview with Kerry Cassidy at Averbury Stone Circle, uh, I talked about the situation in Ukraine 
Um, and I just tried to point out that President Putin isn't quite the bad guy that the establishment is trying to pin, paint him as. But on an energetic level, it's been changed. More and more people are, they're not rebelling. What they're saying is, I don't want this world anymore. And think about the word mindfulness. How many community centers now are springing up teaching mindfulness? Because you know, if you're a businessman or businesswoman, it's okay to say, oh, my life is so stressed. I want something different. I'll go and do this mindfulness Buddhist training. Because that's the first stage. They can do that. They can't say, um, I want to completely change my lifestyle, I want to meditate, etc., etc. That comes later. But 10 years ago, you wouldn't have had this move. And this is incredibly terrifying for the establishment. It is losing control of its community. And that is why they have a plan to attempt to take back that control. That could be either through a, um, an Ebola virus, which then requires everybody to be inoculated against. It might be advanced um, electromagnetic pulses. It might be something else. But I want you all, as we draw to a close now, to be on your guard, to be aware that as they run out of time, so they become more desperate. And as they become more desperate, they become more obvious. But please don't be fearful. Do not be scared. Trust in yourselves. Believe in yourselves. Anybody who's alive now, in these years, you're here for a reason. It's a very, very hard time, but a very, very wonderful time. And if you're here now to experience what is happening, you are actually the trailblazers for the future. There's no question of that. This is a very special time that we're in. So we need to... I think, not turn our back on our world because we need money, we need to do a job, we have to exist, we have to be accepted, but don't compromise who you truly are. Don't lose the values. Humans are fantastic. Uh, you have so much going for you. You have the ability to be something quite unique. It's because of that that there's so much outside interest in you. Um, the energies that you give off, the ability to create from nothing. And of course, you don't realize just how special you are, but that's deliberate, because if you all knew how special you were, you wouldn't put up with the crap that goes around you. So what I want to do is to draw it to a close. I'm happy to take any questions, um, and then I guess we can just go, okay? Are there any questions? Lady there. Yeah? I'm not going to know your name. Who's putting a hand up? Ah, right, guy, yeah. I thought you were very tall. We'll try to wrap that up. Have you heard of, um, have you heard of, or do you have any opinion of a race of ETs called the Vigon? Have you heard of them? Have you heard of them? Have you heard of them? I didn't use that during my talk on the gin. Um, I'm quite happy to, to go along with the term VLON. Um, they are a master race who are expert at subverting, lying and tricking. Um, uh, they manipulate other races, they're energetic, they use their intellect to obtain what they want. They're parasites. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree that they exist. Um, and these are the creatures that need to be starved of energy. Because, you know what, they'll just move on somewhere else. That's a fine thing. Did you actually communicate with your parents as to what was going on? Um, well, I, my father left the family when I was, before I was one year old. And um, uh, my mother never remarried, never had another boyfriend. She said to me her job was just to bring me up. Um, I communicated to her uh, the spaceships I'd seen and the creatures I'd seen. And she would always say to me, draw them, then I will show them to the people I work with. And that's what she would do. Um, the, the earliest memory that I have would be, in, in terms of sort of cognizant, would be 1963, when we lived in a place called Hove, which was in Sussex, by the seaside. 
and um, uh, I can remember that my mother wasn't there and a what I would now call a gin came through the wall and this is the very first time I'd seen a gin in this shape so we're talking about the traditional black shape and that actually quite scared me because I'd never seen one before but it didn't get the reaction it wanted. It didn't want to scare me. So in my mind, it changed into a policeman. And that made me more scary. But you have to remember in 1963, the police were a lot more friendly with the communities. And this creature, I already had a psychic link, and I could tell the creature was not panicking, but couldn't understand why this new image wasn't making me settled because it's a policeman, they protect you, why are you scared of me? I got more and more upset, it changed into a clown. And the image I got in my head was like clowns throwing buckets of feathers and custard pies and all that. But what these creatures don't understand is that in the big top with 500 other kids all screaming, that's really funny. But when something walks through your wall, and changes, it's not in the right context, but these creatures don't understand that. So it became, I became absolutely uh, terrified, and I ran to, for the door to get out. And these creatures don't actually walk when they're energetic, they glide, and it just cut me straight off. So then I went and hid behind the sofa and crawled into the fetal position, absolutely terrified. And then I heard my name being called, and then I peeped out, and what I saw was a hand holding a rod this long, and I looked into it as a crystal on the end, and each facet illuminated in clockwise blue. And when the circle had connected, a blue light shot out, and that's me gone. And the next thing I know, I'm floating, literally floating out of the room, my next memory is I'm in a, in a metal room, no sharp corners, <laughs> no dust. We lived in a Victorian house. Um, and what appeared to be the sofa from which I'd been behind. And a dear, dear old lady, dear old lady sitting in front of me, stroking my hand. Dear old lady, very odd. And giving me toys. So I'm sitting there with this dear old lady who I don't know who she is, and I've got toys. And after a while, I think, well, this isn't right. Where's my mother? And uh, as soon as I think, where's my mother? My mother appears. And the old lady points and says, there's your mother, look. And then I look, and sure enough, there's my mother. But at the moment I look at her, her face changes. And I see a completely different face, an alien face. And this is where we get this knowledge of this term about Simon Parks, his mother was an alien. Of course, the media never understood it, and I'm going to explain it to you in detail, as we've got five minutes. So, the figure in front of me has a face which looks like my mother, dressed like my mother, and then changes to that of an alien face, what we would call a mantid, a mantis face, and it switches, but each time it switches, the human face stays for shorter and shorter period until we've got long periods with the alien face. And the telepathic message I get every time I see my mother's face is, this is your mother. But when I see the alien face, this is your real mother. And then I just jump up, run to the alien, hold my hands out, remember I'm three years old, and shout, mummy, 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 come and see my toys. And the creature bends down, picks me up, and says, you are truly loved, etc., 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 because I had accepted it as my mother in its alien face. So from that moment onwards, it never had to come in disguise to me because I had accepted it. And as a young child, three years old, I called my human mother, Daddy. Because why would I call her Mummy? I already had a mother. And then you got to, by the age of I was four, this just wasn't right, and you learn that this isn't acceptable. So I am the way I am because I have accepted these creatures. I didn't uh, have a nervous breakdown or a mental breakdown, um, and 
because obviously what's inside me isn't very particularly earth human. So I can connect with these creatures and I don't get stressed as humans do. When I did the, the television interview, um, which I put the clip up for, I have a funny story where I say to people that I was being interviewed by um, Holly Willoughby and, and co, and just before the cameras roll, they count down 20, 19, 18, and they count down. And the girls who do the makeup have these fantastic belts around their waist and brush, brush delight. I mean, they've got hundreds of brushes, makeup brushes, all the rest of it. And the camera guy shouting out, 10, 9. And she comes up to me to powder my face and she stops. And she says, you're not sweating. I said, no, I'm not like you. So that's how I coped. Because the stuff I've seen, the stuff that happens to me every day, and the interactions don't knock me down. Because my connections aren't just here on Earth. OK. Any last questions? Hi. Um, we often associate these sort of creatures with UFOs, those UFO sighting like Amsterdam. What's the association? Are they aliens in disguise? Are they little creatures? So some, some jinn will pretend to be aliens. Some uh, military in my lab will take people and the people think they've been taken by aliens when they've actually been taken by military people. Um, the, the UFOs, there's a guy called Charles Hall who spoke in a probe twice now, or three times, and he's an American guy and he worked on Area 51 and he was a weatherman and he talked about the tall greys. The tall greys are your genuine ET. That means they come here in real time. It takes the tall greys between 18 and 20 years to travel from their planet to here. That's real time, 20 years. The creatures that I interact with couldn't do that. It would take them thousands of years. So they use a portal. They come from the fourth dimension to the third dimension through a portal, just like that, boom. Because why should they wait? They're not going to wait 20 years. It's this just not for them. So they are extra dimensional entities. Jinn are interdimensional entities. When humanity was on this planet, when we were light creatures, light beings, we were in this reality. And our consciousness forced the jinn out but not into the fourth. So the consciousness of the jinn was trapped between the third and the fourth dimension. That's why they hate humanity, because this was their planet in their view. The earth has accepted humans. The earth has a covenant with you. That's why you're not all dead and not thrown off the planet, because it loves you. That's why it's important to love the earth. The jinn don't like it, so when the magician calls them from the interdimension to this reality, then the jinn are quite happy to have a go at somebody because they have this harboured uh, bad will and bad feeling. Um, I hope that helps. Hi. Uh, what we think of as satanic evil, <coughs> yep. is that, are you saying that's the result of jinn possession? No, I'm saying that the satanic is a cult, it's a rule, it's a culture, it's a ceremony, it's a ritual. If you join a satanic grouping, you are joining a subgroup within a magical circle. When the Illuminati approached me to join the Rosicrucians, um, that I was offered a place within the Illuminati within a magical line, which I obviously turned down. But within magical lines of the Illuminati are satanic groupings. So Jimmy Savile was a Satanist. We know Jimmy Savile was a Satanist because when he was torturing children, he chanted in Latin. But that really doesn't come out in the news, does it? So no, um, anybody who has the magical ability can call forth a jinn. There's no problem in that. It's what do you intend to do with it? When you call a jinn forward, why are you calling it? Are you calling it to have a, have a chat? Or do you want it to do something for you? So being a satan, being, a, being someone from the satanic part of you is a club where you have signed away your individual rights to serve something else. Okay. One more. Okay. 
young man. Hi. Jin, Jin will enter your body through your left shoulder. If you have had a tapping, or a tapping on some part of your body, that is a Jin attempting to gain entry to you. Um, yes, quite simply, you just refuse to have it. Sounds easy, doesn't it? You might, you might be battling this mentally for 20 minutes or an hour. Um, it's been sent against you. If, you. if you feel you have a demonic possession, Facebook me. Do it. Send me a message. Um, and I will, I will assist you and help you. Um, hi. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put a spell on David Cameron. <laughs> I'm going to climb into his brain and torment him. I think yeah. probably they would. They would. I probably think there's no room for you because everyone else has done it. You, you've talked about fracking. Fracking is evil. It's designed to destroy the energetic signature of England. England is a magical country. It has some tremendous links with Mother Earth. And under the ground are water courses, which just like your veins in your body, carry your blood around your body. So the earth uses water, pure water, to carry um, indented signatures from one part of one node of Britain to another part and throughout the world. So their plan is to put crap into the waterways to block up the arteries and therefore to um, break the contact between the people of Earth and England and the planet. France has banned fracking. Germany has banned fracking. The companies who want to frack in Britain are French. So they're quite happy to destroy our country, but not theirs. Why would uh, any government allow this to happen? Because there's an agenda which is not in the newspapers. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now 9.59. Thank you ever so much. Thank you.